Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Justin Jacobs and I'm the lead developer for Flare. Flare is an acronym which stands for the Free Libre Action Role-Playing Engine. For those of you unfamiliar with action role-playing games, here's my rough definition. The movement and combat, which are core to this sort of game, happen in real time. So this is in contrast to a game like chess where the players take turns performing their actions. So as the player progresses through the game, they'll earn some form of experience points in order to strengthen their character and their abilities. They'll also collect a loot in the form of items which they can wear and use to further empower their character. And lastly, they'll need some sort of reason to want to get stronger. So that's why there are quests to complete in order to give the player some sort of broader goals. Flare is actually broken up into two components, what we call the engine and the game. Flare as an engine is responsible for all the functionality in the game. This includes all the low-level necessities, such as handling input and drawing to the screen. And it also includes all the core functions, such as how entities move in the world and the AI behavior of enemies. Technically, the engine is quite simple as far as modern video games are concerned. It's only about 46,000 lines of C++ and only uses the SDL2 libraries as dependencies. So this keeps it fairly welcoming to hack on and makes it easy to support a bunch of different platforms. We directly support the three major OSs, Windows, Mac, and Linux, as well as a mobile version on Android and a version that runs in a web browser. What's pretty cool is that we've also seen other people port the game to more obscure OSs like Kaiku and Amiga OS 4. But the engine isn't much by itself, which is why we ship our own game alongside, alongside of it. One thing I should mention up front is that we use the terms game and mod interchangeably a lot. A game in this context is essentially one big mod, so the game that we ship is a mod made up of the text files and art resources that the engine can parse and turn to something that the player can actually interact with. So our game is called the Empyrean Campaign. It has a fantasy theme, so think Dungeons and Dragons, Swords, Skeletons, Magic, that sort of thing. When creating a new character, players can pick one of three different classes. These fall into the familiar archetypes of Warrior, Archer, and Mage. Each class has its own set of abilities, which we call powers, that are unique to that class. There's one main quest that spans the entire game, as well as several side quests. So completing the game takes about three to five hours for most players. So what I'd like to do now is go through Flair's past a bit and give you an idea of how we got to where we are today. The original concept was created by a guy named Clint Bellinger and was pretty different to what it is today. The concept was more similar to a game like chess, where that it was turn-based and instead of real-time, and the movement was fixed to a grid. It was also written in Java. But Clint moved away from that concept pretty quickly and transformed the project into an action RPG written in C++. Clint released the first public version of the game, OSARE, or Open Source Action Role-Playing Engine, at the beginning of 2010. You can see what that looks like in the screenshot on the right there. So near the end of 2010, Clint renamed the project from OSARE to Flare after a suggestion from Richard Stallman. I think most would agree that Flare is a better name for the project. So jumping ahead a bit, March of 2012 is when I joined the project. I don't remember exactly how I found out about Flare, but I was no doubt looking for games to play on Linux. Back in 2012, gaming on Linux was much less established than it is today. There was no Steam, and your only real options were a small handful of proprietary games, a smaller selection of free software games, and console emulation. Flare stood out because it was in a genre of games that I already liked, and was well made despite being in an alpha state at that point. It also ran pretty well on low-end hardware, like the Asus netbook I was using at the time. I enjoyed Flare so much that I wanted to try my hand at contributing. I was teaching myself C programming at the time, and it seemed like a good way to improve my skills. My first contribution was to make it so that the engine would not crash when the game couldn't start the sound system. It wasn't something particularly useful for me, but the actual code that needed to be written was trivial. So it was a good introductory task to get acquainted with the engine. After that point, I was now part of the team, which consisted of Clint, myself, and about three to four other regular contributors. So development continued as normal through 2012 and 2013. The game content during that time was what we called the alpha demo, which was a loose collection of areas designed to demonstrate the engine's capabilities. But it wasn't a cohesive game with a proper start and end. But then in 2014, some things started to happen. Clint was brainstorming ideas to create a complete game as a replacement for the alpha demo. It was also at that point that we began to talk about the engine being feature complete and releasing a version 1.0. And there was also this idea that we needed to split the engine into two versions to support SDL 1.2 and SDL 2. And somewhere in the midst of all this, I ended up getting nominated as lead developer. 
but 1.0 didn't happen as quickly as we thought. In fact, version 0.19 would be the last public release for the next four years. Some of you might have heard this before, but there's the phrase that the last 10% of a project takes 90% of the time to complete, and that was certainly true in our case. But it turned out that taking our time solved one of our problems for us. SDL2 had become the standard over SDL1.2, so we didn't have to worry anymore about splitting the engine. Now the focus could be on developing the 1.0 game and doing any necessary engine work required to make that happen. During this, I was the only person working on game content and almost the only person working on the engine. We definitely had some great occasional contributors working on engine stuff, but it wasn't the more regular team like we had in 2012. But in my opinion, this type of philosophy works well for game development. Game development involves a lot of subjective decisions, and it can be hampered if too many people are trying to insert their ideas. The alpha demo had quite a bit of this sort of design by community mentality, and it felt disjointed as a result. I want to avoid that for this new game. I was also very lucky. I don't have much artistic talent, which is why it was great that we had a very good collection of resources to work with. All the 3D art, the 2D art, the music, and the sound effects, all of it was already there and ready to be used. So I owe a huge thanks to all of the artists that, who had contributed over the years. Finally, six years after I joined the project and four years after the last version, Flare 1.0 was released in March of 2018. The engine was successfully migrated to SDL2, which made the Android and web browser ports a reality. Flare 1.0 was a big release with a long change log, but I've, so I've highlighted a few of my favorite additions here. Not having the engine locked to 30 frames per second was an important one, at least to me. Uh, when it comes to action games, gamers want things to feel smooth, so being locked to 30 FPS was a big no-no. Event scripts were also an important addition. When we're designing maps, there are what we call events, which can be placed anywhere on the map. So what these will do is when the player triggers them, some sort of action, such as dropping loot or changing some of the map tiles, will execute. So what we did was we pulled that functionality out so that these sorts of actions could be triggered in other places. It opened up a lot of creative possibilities for us where we now had access to all this functionality for items, powers, and NPC dialogue. Books were another feature that let us be more creative. They started off as something simple in 1.0 and were only capable of showing some static text and images. But as we'll see in a bit, books get the ability to utilize event scripts, which gave, gave them all the functionality that event scripts have. And lastly, the changes that we made to the modding system helped provide a bit of future proofing for us. There was now some like dependency checking that try and keep players from enabling a bunch of incompatible mods. And for modders, we made it possible to change some of the text files without having to completely replace them. So it made it a lot easier for modders to make changes on top of the existing game. So at the release of 1.0, we gained a lot more players and we started to get a lot more feedback, which kept development very active for the next year or so. You can see here that one of the things we implemented was an alchemy crafting system. This was made using the book and event script systems, so it became a nice proof of concept for the types of interfaces that modders would be able to create without having to add any additional code to the engine. But then in 2019, things started to slow down again. Version 1.11 would mark the beginning of another hiatus for us. Version 1.12 took two years to finish, and the changelog was similar in length to 1.0's changelog. There were a large quantity of changes to the engine, but many of them were pretty minor. So I picked two things from the game data side of things that I felt were worth talking about here. So we had three quests in the game that involved trapping the player in a portion of the map. They would have to work their way out, and depending on the map, this could mean defeating a boss or navigating through a maze. The problem with this is that we also have an item in the game that lets the player warp back to the hub area. So if the player started one of these quests, warped out, and then returned, we would have to awkwardly reset the quest for them. So I redesigned these quests in such a way that the players can now freely come and go as they please. And since the gimmick was gone, I tried to add a little to each quest to keep them interesting. My favorite might be the middle one. Um, the quest description tells the player to travel a long ways back to an NPC to progress, but there's a faster way if the player has the right items in their inventory and a little intuition. The second thing I want to talk about is the new potions we added in 1.12. Clint had already made these really great icons for the health and mana potions. For the new potions I was adding, it was suggested to me to simply recolor the existing potions but I wanted the new potions to have their own silhouette so the players could easily tell them apart regardless of their color. Now here's what I love that we have freely licensed artwork. Clint released the source files for his potions under the same Creative Commons license as the rest of our game data. So it was trivial to modify Clint's files in order to make my own designs, all while retaining the camera, lighting, and materials he used. The end result is something that looks cohesive. Without knowing, you might even say they all look like they were done by the same artist. 
Okay, maybe coins look a little bit better than mine. So that brings us to today. The current version is 1.13, which we released just a few weeks ago. I spent most of my time on improving gamepad behavior. It was an area that needed a lot of attention, and it'll be important for stuff that, like the Steam Deck, where the primary input method is a gamepad. So because I was focused on that, it was nice that another contributor was able to work on equipment loadouts and fog of war support as additional features. I also want to touch on the text rendering fix. I'm glad I wrote this talk because it gave me a reason to look back at some old screenshots. In doing so, I noticed that the text rendering looked much better in the old alpha versions of the game. Something broke with how text was being blended with the image behind it, and it caused the text to look more thin than it was supposed to be. The effect was subtle enough that it went unnoticed for a long time. So while I was writing this talk, I made a last minute patch for 1.13. The fix itself was stupidly simple. We just draw the same text twice so it effectively blends with a copy of itself. If you get the chance, I recommend looking at the blog post for 1.13. There are some before and after animations on there that illustrate the improvements pretty well. Unfortunately, 1.13 also had some game breaking bugs, so the current version is actually 1.13.04. One of the bugs in question was something that happened when the player died in the game. Well, when you're playtesting your own game, you're usually pretty good at it, so I hadn't encountered it at all when I was playtesting. But because there are now players with a wider range of skill levels playing the new version, it didn't take long for the bug to get reported. So there are a couple of lessons to be learned here. Number one is that bugs are inevitable, no matter how much time you spend trying to be perfect. And number two is that you can't make good games without playtesters, but you also can't get playtesters without making a good game first. So what's next for Flare? Everything we have planned at the moment for 1.14 revolves around one of the core elements of any RPG, the stat sheets. In our game, all entities have stats that are used in combat. Some examples are the entity's hit points, their weapon damage, their accuracy rating, and their elemental resistances. We want to make some aspects of these stats more flexible, and we hope by doing so, modders will have an easier time making their ideas a reality when designing their games. That being said, our modern community has done a great job of exercising their creativity. There's games like Polymorphable and the Ghost Lore demo, which have their own unique design styles. And then there's stuff like Heresy, which builds on our art, as well as using stuff from the open game art community. We attribute this variety to Flare being relatively easy to mod. No programming knowledge is needed, and all the tools we use regularly are free software. Tiled in particular is a great piece of software. They've always been super supportive of our project, and the export plugin for Flare Maps is bundled right in. I've also written my own plugin that helps uh, perform some additional Flare specific tasks, so I can't recommend Tiled enough, uh, even if you're making a game that's not using Flare. So just to give an example of what modding is like in Flare, uh, here's how you would add a weapon to the game. On the left side is the definition that we added to the items text file, and the in-game result is shown there on the right. Most of this should be pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the include statement might be a little mysterious, but all that's doing is taking the contents of another text file and inserting it at that position. We have a bunch of templates for various things. So in this case, we're using the template for a battle axe item. The template defines things like the icon, the sound effect, and the animations, so that we don't need to do that every time we want to create a battle axe. So if you're interested in modding or just want to try playing Flare, you can check us out at flarerpg.org. I want to thank the FSFE for having me today. I also want to thank everyone who's worked on Flare over the years. If you want to follow me, I'm primarily on Twitter at JAJDorkster, and I'm also on Mastodon at Dorkster. Uh, the Mastodon account is pretty much just um, repost from my Twitter, but if you prefer the Fediverse over Twitter, I'm on there as well. So now I think we can turn it over to questions, if anyone has any. Thank you, Chester. Um, yeah, it was a great talk. Um, I will, oh, there's already a question in the chat. Um, how do you test new features on modifications and quests? Is there some testing framework or another cheat to alter the game state? Um, so we don't really have anything formal. It's mostly, I mean, we try our best to be forwards compatible so that we don't introduce any major breaking changes with new versions. So even if we change the syntax for some of the mod stuff, we'll keep the old syntax in there and we'll just, um, and the game log will display like a, a warning message saying like, hey, this is a deprecated feature. Um, we might not support this in the future. Uh, so you might want to change it, but we try to keep things working. Um, if there is a bug or whatever, um, we just kind of rely on people uh, reporting them to our bug tracker, either on the engine's bug tracker or the even our game's uh, bug tracker. 
All right, I hope this answers the question. Um, are there any more questions from? If not, I do have some. <laughs> sure. Okay, I will just too, because um, I'm also doing the translator, the translations in the FSFE. And I was wondering, do you have any translations? And if yes, how do you manage them? Uh, so yes, we absolutely do. Uh, I think I forget how many languages we have. I mentioned on one of these slides. Uh, okay, so yeah, we have 29 different languages. Um, and before we would manage them manually um, by having people send in the, their translation files um, that you could just edit with a plain text editor, um, but we switched to using TransFX um, as a service. So yeah, um, someone in the chat just posted the link to the translation page on our wiki. Um, so yeah, there's instructions on there for how, how to get into it if you're interested in translating for your language or making some of the existing translations better. Thank you very much. Um, there are multiple users typing right now. <laughs> um, is it possible that Flare will become available for iOS in the future? So we had considered it at one point. I think there's actually still um, an iOS platform file in the, in the source files, um, but I don't think anyone's actually worked on it um, since that was introduced. Um, we don't generally want to support iOS because Apple's App Store is so closed off that we don't feel well like supporting that ecosystem. Um, I mean, one thing we'd like to do is get Flare on F-Droid for Android devices as well, because um, right now like it's you have to download the APK and install it manually. Um, I mean, maybe iOS will come one day, but it's not something immediately in the plans. And um, thank you for the answer. <laughs> What challenges did you come up against when initially setting up your development environment back in 2012? Um, so I don't remember the specifics, but Flare has always been very easy to set up. Um, if you go, if you like download the source for Flare, um, there's an install.engine.md uh, file, and that has pretty good instructions for a bunch of different OSs. Um, so Getting set up on Linux is very easy because um, usually you have all the tools that you need. Like all you need is Git, CMake, um, GCC, or CLang, um, whichever compiler you prefer, and that's about it. And the SDL2 libraries um, in most distributions provide those. Um, recently, we made um, getting it built on Windows easier too, uh, thanks to uh, MSYS2, which is a great piece of software. Um, because before people were trying to use Microsoft Visual Studio and that was kind of a mess. Um, so it's nice to have an open source um, solution for that. Um, but yeah, I, I think getting set up is pretty simple. Um, I mean, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if people have them, like trying to get, if they want to start developing for Flare. How many developers do you have? Um, so Sorry, over the years, I mean, I think it's been, it, it's been a lot, um, but right now it's mostly just me. Uh, like I said, we had one other contributor working um, on engine features for 1.13. So people come and go. Um, and that's the nice thing about free software. Like there's no real commitment. So you now whatever you feel like working on, you can work on. Um, usually we're pretty open about new features. Uh, we do like it if people run it by us for it first um, so that they don't do any unnecessary work. Um, but yeah, like you're free to kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, regarding this, I do have another question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, what would you say are the challenges of developing a free software game? And what would you also say are the main advantages? Um, I mean, I don't think there's any real challenges that are different than developing proprietary software. I mean, probably the, the biggest thing would be that if you're developing a small project or if there aren't a lot of developers, you end up kind of playing multiple roles. So a lot of the time I'm not, I don't spend my coding or even working on the game. It's usually just like answering emails or questions on the issue tracker or the forums or anything. So kind of like being community manager is part of it. Um, unless you have like a really big team where you can have someone like dedicated to that. Um, yeah, you, you do sometimes have to play like multiple roles and that's probably the hardest thing. Um, but the nicest thing is that Sometimes unexpectedly people will step up and 
So many things that you don't want to do, um, which is nice. <laughs> that sounds very nice, yes. <laughs> um, okay, there's a, not, a last question in the chat, and then I would say we close the questions after this one, if that's all right. Sure. Um, I see you support Amiga OS 4. Are there any plans to support older Amiga platforms? So we don't manage the Amiga port. Uh, that was actually done just by a fan. Um, so I guess that would be up to them. Uh, I, I don't know how well um, Flare would run with Amiga, like all the versions of Amiga OS. Um, I mean, it might be OK, it might not. Uh, I don't have an Amiga to test it on. So <laughs> that would be interesting to actually see in action. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, thank you for this interesting talk and yeah, thank you for having me. The, um, Christopher Games World. <laughs>